now. Okay, we are back for part six of Camille Paglia's uh, sexual persona. And this time we are going to be, this is our trans session, the infamous uh, <laughs> trans persona that, uh, that, that Paglia likes to talk about and that are, uh, tend to be tend to be fairly controversial, at least uh, on the left and the feminist left, from what I hear. Yes. So let's let's find out how controversial it is. Jeff, uh, since I wasn't there this, this time at the meeting, I'll let you uh, kind of run through it with me first time. Okay. So um, first of all, I guess we got to say that Camille Paglia identifies as trans. She claims this now. At the time that she wrote this book or published the book, she identified as lesbian. So there's been a progression in her development. Um, so in that sense, you could say that she wrote this as a trans in the closet. Um, I'm not sure if that applies in this case, but she is trans now, and she still stands by this these um, this work that she's working on. Right. Uh, and it surprisingly, it, uh, transgenderism, transsexualism, transvestism is very popular in our ancient history and up until recently in fact uh, it's probably coming back now um so first of all uh before we start um we're going to cover a few uh the sexual identities but the first one that she wants to to which they're all connected is the great mother and the reason is that uh, apparently a lot of the uh, religious cults that were associated with great mother goddesses were either transvestism was involved or transsexualism uh, she talks about um, some of the primitive, or sorry, the early, early antiquity uh, cults of Venus had um, male and female priests exchanging vestments. So male priests would wear female garments, female priests, priestesses would wear male garments. Uh, according to some of the ancient um, writers, Venus was her hermaphrodite. She had um, all the parts. Really? And, well, towards late antiquity, she became, according to some, the uh, a created goddess, as in she was she uh, she was born from um, a clamshell uh, and uh, the foam of uh, castrated Uranus. Uranus. So the castrated Uranus. 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 Yeah, I said that wrong. Okay. So apparently, I, that's the original way, but it just sounds too funny. So. I'm told that it's Uranus now. So yes, he was apparently castrated. They threw his uh, genitals in the ocean and the foam that came out, out came Venus or Aphrodite. So her her goddesses, or sorry, her priests and priestesses were transvestites. And in some cases, in some extreme cases of other goddesses and go great, uh, great mother goddesses. Um, men We're talking about Venus goddesses. here. Venus? Yeah, the goddess of love, the love and beauty. <laughs> So late antiquity, she was reduced in a sense to, to um, just the patron, saint, uh, patron goddess of love and beauty. She was apparently a much more powerful one in the very beginning, but lost it all in a sense. Okay. So the great mother is uh, the generic term that uh, Agla uses for all of these, these goddesses, and they're all goddesses. Um, they, uh, it, okay, so she also links this to everyone's childhood. So right off the bat, everybody is born to a colossus of a mother. When you're born, you are tiny. And for many years, your mother is huge compared to you. And she dictates, she controls you. Um, and what appears like at whim. So when you're a very small child, your mother can pick you up, handle you, move you around, feed you, listen to you when you cry or actually react to it. And it all feels, in a sense, capricious from a child's perspective. A uh, child would cry, the mother may or may not come, may or may not come within different time spaces. So all of that is a bit of a, it's, it shows the lack of power that the infant has compared to the mother. Now, here's an interesting quote that she says. The, there has never been a matriarchy in the history of civilization or, or Western culture, as far as you know. There's matrilineal societies, but uh, but within our own individual psyche, every single person has been under the power of their mother, and as such, we have all lived under matriarchy. Right. 
our movement from dependence on the mother to civilization is the overthrow of matriarchy. And That's that an interesting is, way to think about it. <laughs> that is part of the reason why it cannot, it probably cannot exist in civilized in in history or in prehistory even, because overthrowing of matriarchy is in fact a stage in development from like infant and toddler, or from infant perhaps even to toddler or adolescent. So she's saying it's a natural process of overthrowing the the natural matriarchy that exists uh with everybody for a certain amount of time yes precisely that's part yeah we all have to grow up we can't just be with our mothers all the time and be completely dependent on them beyond uh infancy now what if there is no matriarchy to overthrow because mother dialed, died in child childbirth or uh for some reason there's no women around to raise you so we will get to that sexual persona shortly but for the vast majority of people throughout Western history, they've been looked after by mothers. Right. Or by female mothers in particular. Uh, right. But there is the uh, possibility of a nurturing male, but we'll come to that later. So this, this psychological uh, dynamic is created in everyone. So in the past, we talked about special psychological dynamics that are created only in men compared to women. This time we're talking about one that everybody does. So even women are overthrowing the matriarchy as they grow up, they rebel against their mother just as much as boys do. Right. Oh, some more often, right? That's the the uh, the stereotypical teenage girl is more of a of a hassle than the than the boy is. I'm uh, not having any. I do not know. I only have two sons, so <laughs> maybe I have it easy. Okay. Maybe. So, um, so yeah. So uh, any movement from uh, nursery to society is the overthrow of the matriarchy. And this is poetically very resonant. So a lot of, uh, okay, one other thing about the, uh, the colossal mother is that she, is, she appears to be self-sufficient. She doesn't need you. And it appears that she doesn't need it from the child's point of view. It appears that she doesn't need anybody. So a lot of the uh, great mother goddesses are also virgins. So Athena is considered a great mother goddess. Um, and part of what that means, and so are Amazons in that sense too, but um, what it also means is that they don't need men. They don't need no man. That's part of it. Um, they may want one, but they don't need it. Don't so need one no of man. the examples that uh, she gives is Molly Bloom, who is the uh, the main character in, uh, in Ulysses, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. And she considers her a great mother because at one point she, and here's her quote, sleepily mulled over all the men in her life as he, implying their casual interchangeability. So in the great modern novel of Ulysses, uh, Molly Bloom is considered a great mother. Other examples that she gives are the, okay, well, uh, the Mary, the Virgin Mary, uh, or the Madonna, the medieval one. However, she is missing the the raw nature, the 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 um, the Thonianness. And if you recall from the earlier times, Thonian is referring to the the power that is really out there, the the force of nature that's uh, yes personal and you have no chance against. And that it's much stronger in women. Uh, well, women are closer to it in the sense that uh, they oh. feel it more often, especially during pregnancy, like nature is basically having their way with them. Men are deluded into thinking that they can have some sort of control over it. <laughs> yes. Very deluded. <laughs> yes. Uh, she also mentions um, uh, the Egyptian goddess of Net, who apparently uh, didn't need a man to give birth to Ra. Uh, she just gave birth, apparently. Uh, so... Anyway, so the violent, capricious, ambivalent, and deadly nature of uh, the great mother is all, is taken out in the uh, medieval Madonna. Uh, and this is interesting for her because although paganism defeated Christianity by adopting most of it, it didn't do it fully, and that's one of the things where it didn't maintain it. So um, she comes up with this word, which I had to look up, which is archaizing which means consciously imitating something old or old fashioned. And the only time it came back was in romanticism in the more modern era, more romanticism, specifically in the words of uh, Goethe, 
Wordsworth and Swinburne, who apparently Swinburne loved women so much he liked to he went to uh, brothels to be beaten by them, and this is something that uh, we're going to get to shortly at towards the end. Uh, is, right, S and M. Yes, exactly. Um, has a lot to do with your real place in the world. But we'll leave it at that until later. <laughs> so okay. yes, the great mother is the, the start of all of this. So both men and women, in a sense, fall in love with our mother, but we're also told not to be falling in love with our mother, and we have to rebel against that. This creates separation from the mother and growth of the individual and of civilization. Oof. Yes. So, um, wonder. Okay, to because we are an evolved species. To what degree can we? Can something like you know? Can this sort of formulation be said about you know? Uh, you know, Neanderthals or uh, bonobo chimps or chimps? Because you know, if if indeed all these these personae and all these proclivities that you know we have with the, uh, the, the uh, coming free of the of the matriarchy and uh, the the peeing standing up and all this stuff, um, this this must apply to some degree in other species for is it, for this to make any kind of sense. Uh, so it certainly applies to us more than anyone else because we seem to have a conceptual language that is very different from animals. Right. So animals can communicate in the here and now, in the present, like they grunt, they yell, and they scream, they tear their teeth, and all that, and they're communicating in that sense. But um, does she ever speak to our evolution or our other species, our connection to them? Not that I've seen, or not that I can recall. Um, this is actually coming from someone else who I believe was saying that part of the difference in our language from other languages is that we have a past and a future tense, or we can think in the in the conditional and in the um, subjunctive things that aren't these tenses. Anything outside the present is what makes our language different from animal languages. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that uh, that great mother goddess that we don't see in our modern world is her 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 really uh, well. How did she put it? Um, she is very cruel. Uh, so the, and here's her quote: "The goddess's animal fecundity was cruelly dramatized in ritual." Her devotees practiced castration, breast amputation, self-flagellation or slashing, and dismemberment. Breast amputation? Yes. Where is it? So, this is in the third paragraph on the front page. This sacrificial extremity of experience mimics the horrors of Thonian nature. So this kind of stuff happens when you're in nature. I mean, your life gets cut short, you get... Anybody who's like lived in nature is much more scarred than anybody who's lived in civilization. And that is, that's the real world. That's the natural world. As we moved into civilization, we ritualized that. So in the ancient world, this was often, this happened a lot. So there's a lot more castrations happening in the ancient world. Eunuchs were prized for other reasons as well. But there was a lot more religious cults that did this kind of stuff. And today, We've we moved ourselves even further from this by doing it in a safe way with safe words. Part so, of, mm -hmm. okay, go on. So part of the the, the drama of S and M is the same as, is a milder form of the religious practices of some cults in the ancient world, which were a ritualization of what actually can happen to you in nature. So, okay, the, what can happen to you in nature? What, how, how, does, how does practicing castration, breast amputation, and this stuff, where, I, I'm still, so, not, I'm not sure I'm following. Okay, or, so what, what is this for? you're an animal or something like that, or you lose a limb, like we're talking about, uh, actual cutting off parts of you. Um, yeah. When you're either chasing or being chased, when you're fighting nature, your tree falls on you or near you or something like that, you can get hurt very easily, right? Yeah. In ritualized, by ritualizing that, it draws you back into your true place in nature without actually having to go back into your true place in nature. 
so the gods may request this of everybody. A, a breast amputation? That's quite a... It happened in the past, according to her. This is in this was okay. So some of the transvestite transsexualism that happened was women to men meant that. Oh, so you would men have to, to women okay. would be castrated. Wow. Okay. Okay. Part this of, seems horrifying. <laughs> it is in fact horrifying, and there's lingering um, residuals of that today in uh, circumcision. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, female genital mutilation that we call today uh, is another example that has that has uh, an atavistic relationship to that in today's world. What she's claiming is that this can happen in nature quite regularly. A wolf might bite your balls off, essentially, <laughs> okay? This is the kind of stuff that can happen in nature. An animal can, can stomp on your leg, and your only way out is if you dig yourself out, right? Um, so they practice this ritually in some cults, and that continues even to today in a much more reduced manner. But... In addition to that, we do it in a virtual manner through s and through sadomasochism. You're beating people. You're tying them up as if they had lost a limb, for example. All of these kind of things are a virtual form of the ritual, which is a ritualized form of the real thing. Now, what's the connection is that here you have the real world, and here we've got a more and more deluded world that we live in. Right, right, right. So in that sense, it's a quest for authenticity. Our, so, as in okay. our authentic place in the in the universe. So, so these cruelty rituals are are an effort to peel back the curtain from the Apollonian civilization we built. Yes. And get back to. Uh, some of our delusions get get uh, get rid of some of our delusions temporarily. Well, no, no, not even that. It's uh, re uh, re delusionalize ourselves because it's not real. It's just uh, it's a hallmark to it. It's uh -huh. a tradition. It's like in the first case, the first divorce from real nature was in the ritualization of it, right? So our ancient ancestor, this happened to him, or her, or whatever, right? In our modern day, it's it we're virtualizing the ritual so it's even further away so it's it's in the same way that um say the catholic church reenacts the last supper so jesus had the last supper there's a lot of wine and bread and he said this is my body eat it and uh this is my blood drink it we do that if you're a catholic you do that every sunday but it's very different from the original thing it's ritualized and virtualized what a strange species we are. <laughs> these these crazy rituals. Oh my gosh. The funny thing is that it may not be so crazy. It's that we are so deluded that we're not seeing it properly. And we need to have these outlets. We need to have these expressions constantly around us um, or we go crazy. And there's a lot more madness in our civilization now than there's probably ever been in the world, in the history of the world. But that's, did, a, that's a speculation on my part. She doesn't say that. Did you ever cover Hegel? Uh, I have I took a course with uh, him, but I've never done him since. This seems kind of like Hegelian in that it's she, she's she's outing all the contradictions of humanity and, um, and, and seeing how they play on each other. Like civilization is in, in contradiction with our uh, Thonian um, roots or whatever, our, our, the natural world. That um, she is, yes. If that's Hegelian, then she is most certainly pointing out her contradictions. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. Mm -hmm. So, throughout history, violent strikes um, from a superior have signaled a rite of passage. That's uh, one of the things that she's also noted. So, um, knights get tapped with the sword from their sovereign. That's one example. Uh, she gives several other ones. Um, but in today's world, getting smashed or getting beaten up uh, virtually in a ritualistic fashion is what SNM is all about. Parents discipline kids, it, it happens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what she claims is, ha uh, is actually happening. And in that sense, we are looking for that, those stages in our development. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so in some ancient cults, of the, the priests of the Great Mother changed sex in order to become her. Transsexualism was the severe choice, and 
transvesticism less so. And apparently there were lots of them, lots of these cults. Of transsexual personae in cults? Yes, and in government as well. So again, um, a eunuch. Was uh, they didn't just look after harems. They actually looked after a lot of the government officials. They, they were government officials, and part of the, the benefit of it is if you were a eunuch, you could not claim that any of this could be passed on to your kids who so would stay with the king or the crown. One of the uh, main characters in Game of Thrones is a government official who is a eunuch. Sounds like the author knows about this then. Yeah. <laughs> Smart guy. All right. So the first transsexual persona that Paglia, uh, that Paglia adopts, uh, she names it Tyria. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but Tiresias. Tiresias? Tiresi, yeah. Yeah. So uh, mm. he appears in many places, apparently. So, um, but he is the, he's an androgen. So in other words, he mixes male and female. And in this case, quite literally. So he's known as the nurturant male or male mother. Uh, he can be found in sculptures uh, of classical river goddesses and romantic poetry, again, Woodsworth and Keats. And in the modern popular culture, television talk show hosts. I think she's talking Donahue and Dr. Phil. D Donahue is a, is a transsexual persona? Well, n maybe not he himself, but as a talk show host, he had to have one on. He was a nurturing mother Big yes, to yeah. some of those people, right? Doctor Phil does that also, and sometimes he's disciplinary. But you know, he couldn't. You, couldn't you argue they're more their father figures? <sighs> they're being nurturing, which is a mother figure, just okay. and the male male figures are different as well as we've seen in the past. So that's the thing. As long uh, when a male asks nurturing, he's putting on a different sexual persona. Um, in the uh, in the um, in the ancient, I guess, uh, mythology, Tiresias or Tiresias was turned into a woman for seven years and then back into a man. So he actually lived. He was a she and then back into a he. And uh, apparently Zeus and Hera had an argument and they wanted him to answer the question, who enjoys sex more, men or women? And he, apparently having had actual real experience in both sexes, claims that Women enjoy it by a factor or by an intensity of ten to one. Which interestingly, really? which interestingly enough, both Zeus and Hera were upset about. That women enjoyed it more. Yes. Hera. Hera. Ten to one. Yeah, that would be his uh, sister wife, Zeus's sister wife. <laughs> yeah. So he's uh, considered the wise man. Uh, he was the first also, he, he appeared in the uh, Oedip Oedipus uh, play. Oedipus. Yeah, he, uh, he was the first to divine that uh, it was because uh, Oedipus was sleeping with his mother that there was a plague on his kingdom. And apparently T.S. Eliot also puts him in one of his books, The Wasteland. And there he is, the repository of modern sexual miseries. Repository. And, yes, so... <laughs> Figure. Not entirely sure because I haven't read the wastelands, but the theme, according to her, is that spiritual enlightenment produces a feminization of the male. So, if you want to be spiritually enlightened, you may helps if you wear a dress. Okay. Interesting. That's her claim. Um, and uh, when we see a little bit more about trans uh, sexualism, we'll see a little bit more of what that means. Okay. So the closest that we get to a reverse Tiresias is the Pythoness. It's another category of androgen in which her best example is Grace, uh, Gracie Allen, who was, re who was married to George Burns. She's apparently a comedian. Um, and it's hard to say why, because I haven't ever seen her in action. But the point of a uh, Pythoness is that it's uh, an example. It would be a muse or an oracle, which is a woman that is taken over by a male spirit. A male speaks through her. Uh, she, su she suffers in um, a supplanting of her identity. Uh, she's not really a woman anymore, but she's in a woman's body. A man is speaking through her. So this, yeah. uh, uh, this sorry. Go ahead. The, any author who writes a book or a novel or a television show or anything like that, that uh, is a woman and that speaks as a man or creates male characters, has to put on 
a Python S sexual persona. Now, uh, I wonder if now that she is outed, she uh, identifies as trans, mm -hmm. I wonder if she herself thinks she fits this uh, Pythonist uh, category. I haven't heard her say one way or the other, but I know she says she's never identified as a woman, but she hasn't wanted to change uh, her biology. She doesn't want to do any drugs or uh, um, no operations. So, so she, then would she, she be non-binary? That's for her. I'm, I'm just quoting what she said. <laughs> okay. um, I wouldn't want to label her. I right. know, some would not want to be labeled, and uh, that's but. Like I know Judith Butler, who apparently they don't they don't get along very well, refuses the labels. She seems to accept them quite regularly, but they are her labels. She's she claims them. All right. So that's the Pythonese. Drag queens. That's another sexual persona. So uh, according to her, um, these are some of the most enlightened people in the world. And it's interesting that she claims claims that. Uh, the more spiritually enlightened you are, the more feminine as a man you are. So you can see how a drag queen would be very feminine, right? Um, okay. Now, the reason that she says that they are extremely uh, enlightened is because they see through the sexual masks of society. A, trans, uh, a drag queen is acting them out, uh, is, is putting on this, this sexual persona and does it pretty well. But in order to do that, you got to see them in other people. And as you see them in other people, the spiritual uh, re revelation is that they're acting. These are acts that people put on. They're masks, in a sense. Right. And she and a sexual person and a trans and a drag queen, she would most certainly enjoy that. So they they embrace that act. Yes. I guess is what you're saying. Yes. And and that's why they they are enlightened. That's part of it. It's because they see through the other people's. It doesn't mean they see through their own. So uh, also, just uh, just to be clear, she uh, the notion of being born gay or being born trans or anything like that, uh, she looks at that and says, that's ridiculous. Okay? So <coughs> as a lesbian and as a trans person, she doesn't believe that people are born this way. So, th so this is probably where the... Um trans and feminist community take issue with her, I guess? This must be it. Well, this is an interesting point because although they don't, she doesn't get along with uh, Judith Butler, I think Judith Butler says pretty much the same thing. It's not really, a, it's not really something you're born with. It's, it's pretty much a choice. Um, and this is coming from people in that community. So, uh, which, well, okay. In another essay, she asks us to consider, imagine if you could find a gay gene. Right. We, there's a test that could be produced and says, oh, you're gay, you're not. What would that mean politically? Uh, it could it potentially bad things. things. It could be very bad things, yes. If the, if, if the fascists ever gotten back in power, of course, or even conservatives realistically. Yes, <clears throat> fundamentalists of any kind, right? So, um, But that, that, that still has, says nothing about the truth, truth of it, though. No, that's true. Uh, but from her experience, what she's basically saying is, hey, I've been lesbian, I've been trans. It's, I'm not born this way, in a sense. It's it's something you develop. And so then, so great. this kind of flies in the face of the, I don't know if it does, the, the dysphoria, um, like, um, most, not most, but a, a lot of trans people say, you know, I'm, I have a medical condition, I have dysphoria. Um, therefore, you know, I, I don't belong in this body. I'm in the wrong body. Yeah. Uh, now, would then, would, would Pagla say that's something that is developed or can it be an innate? So I don't think she would say it's innate. So what's happened in the past is people have wanted to be closer to their goddesses. And so they've engaged in that kind of stuff. That's why these cults exist. People don't aren't forced to join the cults. They want to join them. Uh, it's part of their their quest, I guess, for uh, meaning and existence and uh, a place in the universe. Excuse me. So a similar thing is happening today, but with just a different system of, of thought. So we have um, we're very different in our way of thinking than the ancients. Uh, we believe that uh, being determines who we are, and so we think that in the terms of being gay uh, or being lesbian, whereas in the past. Um, 
you were people or you were whatever you were a slave uh, a lord or whatever and you performed certain actions so the idea of being gay did not exist prior to like two or three hundred years ago that's true that is true so um with that with the system of thoughts have changed uh there's definitely some difference but people have been doing this being what we would call trans being trans uh for thousands of years so it's act it's it, it's 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 behaving a certain way whereas in the recent times we've essentialized people for into these these ways of life these behaviors i guess these categories yeah essentially yeah, categories. And that categories is sets up a power dynamic which does not in a sense let people be free if you're going to act in a certain way in the past that was your business you did there was nothing uh, that you had to act like to be part of that group today if you want to be gay you have to be a certain way right if you want to be trans you have to be a certain way um, whatever that way is and it changes from time to time and they have all these different categories um, what she's saying is that that is well she doesn't say it but she hints at it it's that that's psychologically less beneficial to the individual what we have today because it sets up more power dynamics but it is the way we think so we're sort of stuck with it unless we want to go back to it also kind of traps people into the categories that that are available or that we put people in precisely yes and then there's always ways to try and get out of that by having uh queer non-gender conforming or and you just keep adding more categories but they all become they all become crystallized or ossified into a particular way it just takes a bit of time and so that, she's saying these categories don't exist they're just you you are a person who is acting the way you want to act yes and we've we've created categories to to classify them precisely yes and um so just to be clear she also doesn't believe in free will so it's not like you're acting this of your own free volition this is what happens in the world now the world does change and actions uh of affect everybody so the idea of thinking in this way is not helpful um like in terms of being is not necessarily helpful for the mental health of modern people so you may need to act this way but it doesn't mean you are this way does that make right. sense sure yeah um then uh, how does she deal with kind of the even biological spectrum of of uh you know of sex like because uh, uh nature doesn't always put out people with perfectly um you know divided along chromosomes along hormones along uh, right. the brain structure that's part of the diversity of human culture and human nature um so as i understand there's about six thousand genes that are related to sexuality or sex so if that in theory and this is from judith butler whom she doesn't really like but i think would make sense in that set of this question if you have six thousand genes that are related to gender um, the possibilities are 6,000 times 6,000 possible combinations. These are the number of sexes that are possible in humanity. And then you can group them up and these ones look the same and call them male. And these ones look the same and call them female, uh, more or less. But um, biologically speaking, I think they're, what's 6,000 times 6,000? Uh, 36 million or something like that? 3,600,000? I don't know, but it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's... That's the number of sexes that there are, are from a genetic perspective uh if it's six thousand genes in that respect um but there's two genders so we fit everybody into that that's and again this idea of there are two genders is a is forced upon you i mean there are lots of cultures in which um okay well there's one particular culture apparently that uh, if all the men die in a family a woman turns into a man as in she starts acting like a man wearing men's clothing and assumes the authority of men and men respect her for that as a man she protects wow. and stuff like that well so, I, I know there are species i don't remember what animal but there are species where that actually happens except not gender wise like it in reality like like a one a male will legitimately turn into a female or vice versa i can't remember which one it happens yeah, there yeah i've heard that too they're usually amphibians if i recall frogs or something like that Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, right. They'll literally switch sexes, if need be. Given, uh, okay. So, so, so that hap So she's saying that ha that can happen in culture. Uh, I mean, obviously, we can't. You know, a, a female can't grow a penis and a man can't grow a vagina. But culturally, if that happens, then somebody has to take on the role of the male 
in that society if the males are all dead or maybe maybe even vice versa yes so um that's that's essentially like this person isn't necessarily what we would call trans um they're doing their duty and they're treated that way by everybody that's a cultural phenomenon so she she looks at that because this is this is how it really is and it's been like this for thousands of years our modern notions are ridiculous in a sense all, all right. right well that's a lot to chew on <laughs> yeah so um going further into the uh drag queens here we have um uh, let's see so they they understand what uh the masks of society are and they like to play with them and uh they display and ostentatiously display the outrageous mannerisms of the sexual masks in a self-parodying way and self-parody is always sex parody which is why drag queens are awesome in that respect um at this point she also brings in two new two i guess ancient sexual persona which we don't see today these are referring to the uh uh venus barbata which is the bearded venus and the the Venus bearded Venus, Venus. Selva, which is the bald Venus. Um, these are ritual drag queens, but unlike drag queens, they actually take the sexual mask seriously. And this was these were acts of worship in the in the temples of Aphrodite in the beginning of ancient Greece. Um, yeah, uh, in late antiquity, they they uh, they lost most of that and became just the goddess of love and beauty, which she laments because it, it really took away a lot of her power. Um, yeah, and so, uh, okay, so for modern example, she claims that, uh, okay, so here's her quote. I adopt the name Venus Barbata and Venus Clava for certain highly aggressive, corrosively verbal movie stars. And then she gives examples, Betty Davis and Elizabeth Taylor. Now, not their characters, but actually them. She's saying the movie stars, not like in an earlier place, uh, she describes Elizabeth Taylor's performance of Cleopatra as a, as a wonderful femme fatale, as well as a, a hermaphrodite. But in this case, Elizabeth Taylor as a person, not as, a, not as one of her characters, is uh, a Venus Clava. Calva. Calva, sorry. So, the, so which one's the bearded? The bearded uh, Venus. Was, uh, well, a bearded Venus actually had a, Venus, a beard. So this was a man who was dressed up like a woman. So okay. uh, I guess it can happen like that. But I think the, the description that she uses is aggressive, corrosively verbal. And she mentions Betty Davis and Elizabeth Taylor. So, so yeah. So anyway, these two are, you don't see them as much anymore, or if you do, it's much harder to see, but she seems to see them in their actions or their antics off the stage. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we get into ritual transvesticism. So this is a drama of female dominance, she claims. Uh, there is a there is a religious meaning for all of this, she claims, in, and this is both in the nightclub or in the bedroom, wherever it is. A woman, and here's her quote, a woman putting on men's clothing merely steals social power. But a man putting on women's clothing is searching for God. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and this has got to do back with the mother, right? He's memori memorializing his mother. Yeah. Okay. Um, and she claims that uh, mothers have had a much more profound influence on their children than fathers do because mothers are there more often at the beginning and that's when certain patterns of life are set so fathers can show up later or if they show up at all and it's rebelling against that that makes uh, the mark uh, moving forward right but there's always that there and uh where does she go so no, sorry. um yeah so okay what is she saying here and unlike fathers, mothers are always changing, perhaps because they see them all the time, but it's also close to nature. She says the four seasons are an aspect of that, whereas men are trying to be more stable. Um, they're trying to end cycles as a general rule. And uh, 
that's why some rituals need to be performed all the time to get back to that female nature kind of stuff. And she claims that this is part of the reason that we have the carnival in Rio de Janeiro and Mardi Gras in New Orleans and Halloween all over the world. Yeah, anyway, so I'm not sure. And uh, do you know what happens on in Philadelphia on New Year's Day? No. No. She gives that as an example too. That's <laughs> in the same boat as Carnival and Mardi Gras and Halloween. I don't know. I don't know what happens in uh, Philadelphia on New Year's Day. These are these are ways to get to pay respect to the motherhood. In a sense, yes, the ever changing nature of motherhood and the. Uh... So uh, just look in our society. How often do men change their haircuts, their hairstyles, compared to how often do women change their hairstyles? Uh, I would say probably yeah, women change them much much more often. And much more often, yes. Um, that's. That's a reflection of the Thonian nature of women. Our desire, men, that is, desire for the straight and narrow, this is the expected, the, the planned, um, is reflected also in the way we dress. How, uh, like, the, the differences in, in the possibility of dress for men are somehow less than women. Women can basically wear anything that men can wear, but men don't usually wear everything that women can wear, right? Right, so, so men go to work in basically a suit or business casual and not there's not much play there but women can show up in all different variety of dresses and well there's a lot more play in what women can do yes uh, there there's a connection that she sees as part of what uh, okay so men are in a sense envious of that and that's part of the reason that we I mean, can yeah. have fun with Mardi Gras in New Orleans from time to time now yeah we want in on the party <laughs> yeah we could say that so uh, female, uh, she goes on to say that uh, female transvestism is different from male transvestism. Drag kings, uh, butch lesbians, uh, and women in general do not have a fetishistic relation to male clothing. Okay, if a woman takes on male clothing, it's usually a utilitarian reason. So it's comfortable, it's social freedom, or there's real authority, like she has to wear a uniform. And then she also considers. <sighs> It occurred to me as, as I was reading this that there's a lot of um, transvestism in Shakespeare. So she, hmm. she asked us to consider the many transvestite women in Shakespeare. They all had a good practical reason for what they were doing. And there's Viola in Twelfth Night, Portia in The Merchant of Venice. This one I don't know. In Go Gen in uh, Sibylline, Sibylline. And Julia and the Two Gentlemen of Verona. And Rosalind, as in As You Like It. They were all females turn to males for a very practical reason. Now, male transvestites uh, are a little different. Uh, they are not only stimulated by male clothing, some of them actually may require orgasm. It's it's a real fetish for them, in other words. Right. right? Um, when a woman puts on clothing, she's a uh, male clothing, she may be arousing others, but what she claims is that men who put on women's clothing are arousing themselves. Fundamental difference. Yeah, wow. Okay. That fundamental difference uh, is, well, it's huge for her. Um, and the reason that this happens is it also is very similar to the, the two other major things that she says that are very, uh, that many feminists don't like. So remember, she said that uh, if we had left uh, civilization in the hands of women, we'd still be living in grass huts. She did she say that. That uh, there was no, um, the, the reason there's no female Mozart is because there's no Jack the Ripper. She builds on that here. Uh, women are not into fetishization of that because they are not sexual, uh, how did she put it? Sexual, uh, where is it? Conceptualizers. What does that mean? So we, it's men that have the fetishes. It's men that have all the uh, great ideas, and women sort of go along with it, right? They, in a sense, have to be taught by men. If they, they've, it doesn't seem to be something that comes to them naturally. They have to be taught it, right? Whereas men have that imagination, and part of the reason is, of course, they're trying to. Men have to, in order to be men, they, men have to act. They have to imagine in that sense. That's part of the uh, the dynamic that was set up from a very early age. Um, so. The reason that their women aren't sex conceptualizers are for those same reasons. It's also why there are no lust murderers, or very few. 
I mean, women can do it, and there have been some in, in history. But a lot more men kill women in intimate relations than women kill men. Right. And or when women do it, usually it's in def self defense. Yes, precisely. It's for a very utilitarian reason, right? Yeah. Uh, that is a fundamental difference between men and women. So, in theory, either one could kill each other. I mean, there's knives in every house. Any woman could kill a man if she wanted to, but they don't. Men, on the other hand, do. There's and they do it in, in that, and they they sometimes do it in weird serial killer ways. Yes, precisely. That is the danger of sexuality, and it's men in particular who are the danger. For that reason, she's saying that there's no less murders because women do not sec are not sexual conceptualizers. It takes a certain amount of Apollonian thought to imagine something, right? And again, we do it because we have to prove ourselves as men through action, whereas women are reminded that they're women every month. They don't. Well, have to do I anything. mean, women women always say, and I think it's true that their sexual imaginations are. Well, maybe not. They have they have their own fantasies too. Oh, there's no doubt that. Yes. Okay. She doesn't say that women don't have fantasies, but their fantasies are, I guess, not as developed as men's. So men are the ones who are directing women, who who pay. Okay. Anytime a man pays for sex, they're telling a woman what to do. Right. It doesn't go the other way. So very rarely does it go the other way. And if it goes the other way, in other words, if women are actually conceptualizing, it's they've been taught to do that in the same way that um, women have been taught all the benefits of civilization and have now appropriated for themselves. But it's not necessarily natural to them because of the psychological um, dynamic that has created from early childhood. Uh, someone from chat is asking if, if Camille Paglia has any evidence. Uh, uh, like, why does she believe that uh, men dressing in women's clothing is to arouse themselves uh, other than, uh, or other than, uh, I mean, instead of uh, arousing other people. Like, what, what, what well, is she going off of? So, um, first of all, other people do get aroused, and it's usually men, all right? But why would you do this, and why do women don't do this? There's a fetishistic relationship to that. Women don't take get orgasm from wearing men's clothing. Some men do. Uh, that's their first piece of, I guess, uh, uh, evidence, but go to a, a drag queen um, concert or uh, performance. the The ritual of looking at yourself in the mirror is is profound. I mean, they have to get their makeup exactly right, their their uh, their their dress and everything exactly right. There is a voyeuristic aspect of that, and we're going to get to voyeurism before the end of this session. Um, that is not common among women. So he, most people could say that women are not as visual as men. You say that there's erotica, erotic literature for women, and then there's porn for men, right? As a general rule. That's part of it. And part of that is that men are very visually oriented. And part of the reason that we're visually oriented, according mm. to her, is that you need to go and look to do something. And that requires the thought that goes with it as well. So. When she says that women, uh, if we had left civilization to women, we'd be living in grass huts, is because they don't have to do anything to be women, whereas men do. And when it goes the wrong way, we become criminals. When we become, when it goes the right way, we become movers and shakers of society. So um, she's of the opinion that uh, men will always be uh, in the dominant positions of power in the world. Doesn't mean that women can't be there. It's just that. The impetus for women to do that is less. Right, less. right. Uh, men have three statistically significant nudges that women don't have, which doesn't mean that all men are going to do it. It's just that men have this slight advantage. Right. Well, so yeah, we we're more compelled to to yeah be in these positions of power and and create and act, mm -hmm. whereas women can but don't have to. That's right. Um, so she goes on to say, uh, as more evidence as to why um, uh, men like this too, is there are more male voyeurs than there are female voyeurs, right? So the female transvestite is in a sense seeking to pass. This is what she says. But the male transvite, transvestite is his own best voyeur. And that's, that's, that's sort of the evidence that she sees. It's like you, if you watch them. Women who dress up in men's clothing, drag kings. Um, 
who are they trying to arouse? Are they aroused by this? Probably not as much as a drag queen is. There's also a lot more drag queen shows than there are drag king shows. Yes, that is very, that is very true. Which suggests that there's something particularly male about this. And it doesn't seem to be changing with uh, more women having more power, and it doesn't seem to be changing with more women having more uh, buying power. So the fact that we're very we're much more similar than maybe we were in the past in terms of buying power and freedom to seek political out, power too, yeah, yeah political power, uh, and yet these differences are not being is fixed in a sense from the liberal le leftist feminist perspective is indicative to her, not so much that there's an imbalance in power still and we have to fix that, but that women don't necessarily want this power. So why is it that in a free society, more women migrate to teaching jobs or to um, healthcare jobs than men and more men still migrate to prison or to the top, uh, the top um, uh, powers, uh, power places in, in, the, in the society. Uh, we're, we're pretty much free. Now, left-leaning feminists would say, well, that's because there's a glass ceiling and there's a whole set of other uh, restrictions on women. And But if that was all equal, uh, we would be there. Or right. Be there. She's saying, no. <laughs> no, because you don't have penises. Uh, and those three nudges, for example. Your entire psychological, a uh, woman's psychological makeup doesn't require them to act. And so it, it's unlikely that that would happen. So, so, so Palia, the way she sees it is, is that uh, big chunks of modern feminism are basically solving problems that aren't real problems. Right, or they're diluted. They're, they're diluted and they're... But <laughs> and, she, here's what she says about women who try and be like men in that sense. They're even more pathetic than men. And I think she's talking about feminists who disagree with her. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. <laughs> So um, the next topic that we were going to talk about was voyeurism and that meaning the pleasure in watching. And uh, for her, uh, all pleasure is sexual. It's different degrees of it. So uh, some people would say voyeurism is sexual pleasure in watching. She says, no, nope, it's we are all voyeurs. Uh, and she basically claims that the relation of every reader to every novel, every spectator to every painting, every play and film, this is that makes you a voyeur if you're enjoying it. Um, even when we study biography and history, and even in our conversations with others or watching others, this is a voyeuristic pleasure that we're taking in, taking in because it's it's pleasure we wouldn't be there. And it's it's an amoral aesthetic. So Christianity may have made it sound uh, very negative. She's saying no. This is part of the joy in life. This is the joy of having eyes. And sexual persona are a manifestation meant to be seen by others, meant to be experienced and. Uh, and heard, but mostly seen. And that's part of what makes civilization a wonderful thing. So you want, in that sense, voyeurism is a very good thing. It, okay. uh, it's enlivening, it enlightens us, it, uh, it helps us see things that uh, we wouldn't otherwise see or we shouldn't be seeing. Uh, no, I shouldn't say we shouldn't be seeing. It makes clear, in the case of a drag queen, um, all the masks of the sexual persona and their, in a sense, ridiculousness and funniness and playfulness of it all so she sees it as a it seems a very good thing and it's lamentable that it's uh that it's condemned quite often that voyeur that voyeurism is condemned yes interesting well I, yeah she said she feels the same way about uh, pederasts and pedophiles too so <laughs> i don't i don't know what to think there Yes, well, we're probably all hypocrites if we have an internet connection at home and say that there is not good. True. All right, so, and the last thing she wants to talk about is sadomasochism. Oh, does she say anything about exhibitionism? No, not not that I recall. Like, uh, like the, the weird, because you'd think, Kate, this, you would think that she would fit this in there, the weird proclivity of some men to expose themselves. Yeah, no, she doesn't talk about that. It's like, okay, in the sense that we're all displaying our sexual persona at any time in any given day, we're all exhibitionists in that sense. Okay, right. So it doesn't have to be full on, just like, yeah. Wank. Yeah. But she doesn't talk about that kind, no. 
there's other philosophers who do. The kind, if you ever want to talk about him, we can talk about him. <laughs> He'll, he's got a good explanation for that. Actually, I think I heard that recently, and yeah, that's maybe I'll get back to that. All right, let's move on. Okay. S and M. Yes, sadomasochism. So this is a relatively new term in Western history, but the acts, the rituals that go with it, have been around since prehistory. And uh, she, <laughs> she's got this interesting. Um, I guess, a, not anecdote, I guess it would be a muse. So, so for 2,000 years, the torture of martyred saints, as well as Christ, has filled Western imagination with sadomastic reverie. Imagine this, if you're a Catholic, for the last 2,000 years, the central and biggest work of art in any Catholic church is a nearly naked man, crucified, tortured, and dying on a cross. Does this not have an effect on a culture? Yeah. yeah, it does. So, so, someone else has made this point. I don't remember uh, who. Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag? Yeah. Might have been talked about in uh, Bill Maher's movie, Religi Religious. Mm. So imagine you're praying in front of this thing, the holiest of thoughts, and you've got this dying, dead, pierced man uh, tortured on a cross. It has profound effects on the psychology of Western people. Um, Protestantists, Protestants have tried to take away the nakedness of it and replaced it with just a cross. Um, and this sort of brings it back closer to, I guess, the original intent, uh, because before it became part of the, the uh, official Roman Empire, they didn't have the images. They were much more, uh, they were a Semitic cult, right? They were right. a Jewish cult. Um, the paganism wanted to see, wanted to, you know, visualize it. And so it was there. And it was, it's, it's still there if you go to any Catholic church today. Uh, so some other more examples of these uh, sexual... Uh, okay, she goes through several examples of uh, ritual sexual torture and sacrifice in various time periods from antiquity to, the, to today, various time places. So it seems to be a pretty universal thing throughout um, human culture, not just Western culture. Um, and the fact that it mimics nature is profound for her. This is, we touched on this earlier, it's the idea that you're getting back to your true place in nature in a safe, more safe at least. Um, controlled kind of way. Controlled way, yes. So it's a touch, you're trying to in a sense touch your place in the world. So if you can imagine, uh, people often go to like volcanoes or waterfalls to try and get a, a a, a rush and a rush, yeah. but maybe also if there's a religious experience where you're trying to get close to God, you're close to nature, you're you're that's part yeah. of what it is. So the cinematic impulse in people, according to her, is in is similar to or analogous to the search for God. And it starts with it may be perverted and some for some people would say it's perverted, but the the underlying quest to find your place in nature is there um so if you can imagine uh some some sadomasochists the, the idea is that the uh the woman is punishing a child and he's acting like a child right it takes you back to the time of your mother but it also puts you at a point in time when you are much closer to nature as a child you are fully at the mercy of this woman not unlike how we really are fully at the mercy of nature. We delude ourselves to think we're not. Right. So by getting back to this, it's a virtual or ritualized form of the truth. Play in play, as opposed to in real danger. Uh, okay, that's S and M. Is yes, that? Yes, so that is S and M. Okay. So, so act acts of okay. Well, uh, there's but there's there's two. Usually, there's two aspects of mm -hmm. of, of say masochism, right? You have the one person who's the 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 dominate dominatrix, the dominator, and then you have the submissive. Yes. So, um, is one of them getting closer to nature than the other, or are they both? They both are because remember, you are the dominant one until you are not. At that point, nature has its way with you. So now, one of the things that she points out is that um, in a sadomasochistic relationship, there's 
there's a whole bunch of ritual, but you can upend the na the natural way that uh, the world is, or you can support it. You can mimic it. There's no hard and fast rule that it has to be this way or that way. So it is both supportive and counter to civilization. It's fun in that sense, she's saying. And the reason that it's desirable is because it brings us, in a sense, closer to nature. So as the Dom, you are able to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do. Yeah. The submissive, you're in a place where the delusions all around you are saying you don't, you're not really there. Because in civilization, we're taught all around us, hey, we're in a safe place. This is a good place. We want to stay here. Uh, don't worry about nature. We've got that covered, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so in that sense, both of them in the play uh, and in the scene or in the uh, whatever they decide to do can have their imaginations run wild and still have the sort of religious experience that is associated with their true place in nature. Why do humans want to be close to nature? It's a quest. Well, she hints at this. Every delusion is an unstable kind of thing. It needs to be reinforced for us to have it. But we also need an escape from delusion. We need a moment of truth with ourselves. Delusion creates its its own contradictions. This is so Hegelian. <laughs> In that sense, yes. But every now and then, some people, you want to be honest with yourself even once in a while, right? I mean, you can, you can, uh, you can claim to believe something and then it doesn't make a difference whether you do or not in some cases. So what I'm suggesting is you can't live a lie forever. And that includes the delusions of humanity. It may be more pleasant to believe these things, but you need an escape out of it. Sex often provides that. Sadomasochism does that too. Okay. So, 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 sadomas so ma yeah, sadomasochism is kind of a more more how is it different than sex okay sex again is very dangerous um it's always men that are hurting women right uh it's sure. bringing us in touch with our thonian nature um at a <laughs> the whole point of sex is that uh, it it liberates us as well as obliterates the norms of society you just what you do behind closed doors is very different than what you would do outside of closed doors right <laughs> The same is true for sadomasochism. It's another form of expanding that, um, ritualized and virtualized. But this is the sex concept uh, conceptualization, right? So, so wait, wait is, it, is it a ritualized version of sex? Is that what it is? Uh, no, sex, it could be. It doesn't have to be. It could okay. be. Uh, it could also, the, the, the boundaries and the contours associated with sadomasochism are much, much wider right? Sex doesn't have to be involved. Oh, okay. So right. you could just be someone, right, right. Because, yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, in that sense, this always comes out in the most decadent of societies, because that's when you have the most ability to enjoy and conceptualize different things. If you're just fighting for survival, you are in a sadomastic relationship with nature, and you're the submissive. Right, right. As you get out of that, it's a liberating experience, but it's a delusion, she says. And sometimes we need to get back to that, even if it's only in ritual. And that's why religion and the cults of the ancient world had these kind of things in them. Now, the the transsexual persona, persona mm -hmm. that she talks that we talked about today. She, does does she not say that these also only you only see these in the most decadent of societies? You see them definitely more, yes. So the more time, the more opportunity you have for freedom, uh, free time, the more you're going to get into these things. So at one point she says that uh, the more free we are, the more we search for prisons. <laughs> oh, prisons, in what way? Um, well, imagine if you're in love with somebody, you're certainly beholden to them, right? Yeah. That's the type of prison you're escaping from. You can do whatever you want to. I want to do what she wants me to do. And how does that, how does... Uh... How does that relate to uh, the um, sadomasochism? Well, and and trans uh, persona. Oh, th these are uh, in a sense sexual conceptualizations where we are living life to a fuller degree than we could otherwise. So we're okay. So we're free to explore these things. 
when yes. we otherwise wouldn't be. Exactly. So I I, I, I can I, so I know some some trans and non-binary folk would say that this is kind of an it's erasing their um their identity or or it's erasing them by saying that they they're just a product of a decadent civilization. Um, well, they wouldn't have any opportunity to be trans if they were fighting for survival at every moment of their life. Right. Right. That, so that's the uh, that's the benefit of a tr of a decadent civilization. You so can, you have the luxury to be trans in a in a decadent yes decadent civilization, and that's a good thing. Yes, a very good thing. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you know. Okay. Right, because I think I, I've said this elsewhere. If you if you're on a if you're stranded on an island by yourself, um, or let's say you find let's say you were a trans person in civilization, and then all of a sudden you find yourself, uh, you're a trans woman in civilization. Then you find yourself stranded on a desert island, uh, and you and you're there's just no other humans. There's no society, no nothing to be social with. Are you still tr a trans person on that island? Uh, are you still are you still a, a man trapped in a sorry a, a biological man trapped in a no a woman trapped in a man's body? Um, would you still feel these these feelings? Um, probably, I think that she would say probably not if you're fighting for survival. If you're spending like all your waking hours trying to fish to survive, you have no opportunity to express that. Right. And insofar as you do not express it, you're not that. You may be. Uh, so part of the reason that uh, kids, okay, she, she goes through this at one point. Part of the reason that kids um, dress up in, or boys dress up in their in, uh, women's clothing is that when they were very young, they found their mother's clothing. And they tried it on. If you never have an opportunity to do that because you have to be out working, you're not going to have the opportunity to develop that part of your, uh, that part of, that fun part of your life. So... Yes, you definitely need the decadence part. You need the free time, the the ability to think and imagine, and the the free socialization. Like if you're always working with somebody in the field, say you're a slave in the uh, 18th century, um, there probably weren't any trans or gay people uh, at that time because they didn't have the opportunity to express that. When the, if they did, uh, it was probably in a very um, limited form. Whereas in a decadent society, you can take it much much further. Right, but okay, but there's always, I mean, there's all kinds of stories of, you know, from 100 years ago, 200 years ago of repressed uh, homosexuals or people who are interested in the same sex. Uh, I, okay, so I think what she would say is that it's not that they were repressed per se, it's that they, had, they found an opportunity to express it um, when nobody else had. Or, nobody or, I, or I mean, society would punish them so they couldn't. That they had to hide. Too. They had to hide it away, or whatever. Well, that happens today too, and maybe yeah. less so. But that's because we're more decadent. So, um, okay, I'm reminded of the movie. Uh, just in the case, just an example of sex. I mean, in a decadent society, you have a lot more sex than if you are not in a decadent society. So I was thinking, that, you know, that movie, Enemy at the Gates, right? Uh, uh, yes. It's uh, about the uh, yes. German sharpshooter, or sorry, the Russian sharpshooter and the German sharpshooter, right? They're fighting for their survival every moment of every day, and they're pretty much sleeping whenever they're not. There's very little opportunity for sex. The one sex scene, if you recall, was very short. It was like, well, everybody else is sleeping on the floor, and they sort of did it in secret. Not because they were repressed. They wanted, this was a personal thing between them, but there was no other opportunity. They had to sort of do it when everybody else was sleeping and they had to be very quiet about it. They weren't in a sense repressed. The situation in which they found themselves was not decadent at all. They didn't have the free time, the space, the time and space to do it. The same would be true if you were a slave. And this would be true um, pretty much anywhere. If you don't have the, the, the opportunity to express how you feel about any one person, um, or how you feel about expressing yourself. Like, I mean, uh, if there's no women's clothing to wear, you can't express yourself as a drag queen. Right, right. So that necessarily comes with with decadent society where you have the time to, and the material wealth to actually get that stuff. 
it doesn't mean that it didn't exist. But so, the way you're expressing it today is in terms of being language. The person so, is trans, but so, that's ridiculous, she says. So trans or non-binary non people should not feel trivialized or erased just because civilization is what allows, or decadent civilization is what allows their expression their expression their performance yes so yeah if they're in a situation where there's nobody else around like your desert island <laughs> this there's no room there's there's no opportunity for that expression to yeah and in that does and that, that's an excellent example in a sense there's no repression on that a desert island either right but because there's no women's clothing this trans man is not going to be this this man is not going to be trans woman so in her estimation the problem really comes down to our obsession with essentializing and these categories that we put ourselves into um instead of just treating all these things as different behaviors and and uh precisely yes so uh, i've just had a discussion with my kid he's uh he's learned a few swear words or i guess i should say foul words uh he learned trans and he learned i get and all that kind of stuff and uh, he's starting to use them he's making jokes about them in a sense, that is a sort of repression, but that's a lingering kind of repression. Um, it's, so easy, it's more easily overcome today because it can be manifested and people do it all the time. In the past, it may have been unhelpful for the society. So if you are if you're a soldier and there's no women's clothing out there, you're not going to be a transvestite. You're not going to be a drag queen. You come home for one day to do it. it, it, it it's so odd because, say, you, you're in a mo for a moment, you're in a decadent society. So if you're a soldier and you're out in the battlefield, you're not in a decadent society at all. You are fighting for your life. You come home to a decadent society for a little while, and you experience that. Then you go back. You can't do that. It's not repression as such. It's just an opportunity to express yourself. Um, now, what about the... Uh the critique that Pallia is um, reinforcing gender norms by talking about these things in terms of women's clothing, men's clothing, and the different, those two categories. So they exist. There's no doubt about that. And um, many people are quite happy with them. I personally like my clothing. <laughs> There's, it's the style that I've, I'm comfortable with and that I like to express. Um, but there's an opportunity uh, for other people to dress differently. And I don't, she doesn't see that as a problem. She sees that as a great thing. She doesn't um, see the, the problem of the categories of, of uh, male I see and the female. Category, yes. Sorry, um, the categories, yes. The categories are power and balance. Uh, you're setting up, if you're trans, you have to act this way. If you're a butch lesbian, you have to act this way. If you're uh, a sadomasochist, you have to dress this way and you act this way. And that's, that's, uh, that's not necessarily the case. That, that's a very limiting thing. It, in fact, makes you act in a way that uh, is comfortable to those people who are not that category. So they become comfortable with this particular narrative. But that narrative isn't necessarily you. And that's the problem from her perspective. In a, in a more decadent society, it shouldn't matter. In a sense, like right now, I believe um, non-binary queer is the most general term for whatever someday in the future that's going to be there's going to be a much more firm narrative and they're going to need to find something else but the idea is that i suspect you accept the, the labels that you want insofar as you want them but you're never defined by them so we have this category of women's clothing but drag queens can take it and work with it and do so many wonderful things right right they wouldn't they wouldn't drag queens wouldn't love it were it not for the fact that women that was what was clothing yeah, exactly if it, if it was non-binary clothing or if it was like bland any gender clothing that it might not do anything for them exactly the fact, the fact that it's women's it's women it's clothing for women to express express themselves that is what turns them on about it or, or at least that's what they like about it yes so in the same sense, like, uh, you know, the haiku, right? It's got like, you got 21 syllables, you got to say it in 21 syllables. It does set some structure to what you do and it bounds that. But in that boundary, you can create great poetry. I assume in Japanese, I don't know it very well, but that's the uh, sonnet is similar, right? You have to tell the story within 
Right. And, like that. and so the boundaries they, themselves kind of give it a, a form that yeah. you can you can use and, and play with. And that's what these sexual persona are working on. And we stylize them in every generation a little bit different, but it's there. So I don't think she would get rid of the categories per se, but at the same time, I don't think she would say the categories are so hard and fixed that they um, that they force somebody to be this. Like there is no perfect trans person or perfect drag queen. Um, there's just a wonderful expression of it. So so gender abolitionism, uh, the kind of the the idea that she um, would hate that. I think she would hate that. So the idea that you could that you could actually make a society where no one there wasn't genders and people and um you could you're just you're just a human either way you can act um, however you want yeah um that's a sexual persona for her it's an androgen you're mixing it oh up right to be fit. so that's so just it's, one that's just one of the sexual persona yes yes uh, it's, a, it's a style of sexual persona that can be applied to several of them as well um the idea of mixing and matching particular things. It doesn't mean you have to be all the male stereotypes and all the female stereotypes in one. You just pick and choose. And sometimes you might actually want to go to an extreme, which is what the hermaphrodite does. Come fully feminine, fully masculine at any one time. Does both. Yeah. Okay. But not at the same time. Not at the same time. Same time. Okay. Have, have we covered all of S and M? Uh, so there's a little bit more. So um, she she likes uh, the Marquis de Sade. Uh, she feels that uh, he's been mis... No, he hasn't been misunderstood. He's been not read enough. Uh, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who she thinks is the uh, great idealizer of peace, love, and harmony, uh, created... A, I mean, he had an effect on the civilization. But the Marquis de Claude, who came after him, wrote, in many cases, a point-by-point -point refutation of his peace, love, and harmony thesis. So all people should live in peace, love, and harmony, sort of like, you know, John Lennon's Imagine. And she's saying, yeah, no, <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, it never has worked, never will work. It will always lead to sadomasochism. So it's one extreme, and you've got to play with them both. Now, it's an idealist form. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, it's not real. It's it's more of a delusion than the sadomasochistic or the, the um, Marquis de Sade. But you sort of need them both to have the most rich society. Need both the Marquis de Sade and the Rousseau? Yes, precisely. So what she's advocating, and she says, don't ever read them out before breakfast because, or just after breakfast because you could throw up because it's pretty, pretty bad cases. But the message behind it the message behind it is that it's this is the world <clears throat> excuse me we live in a world that is dangerous that is full of lust and violence and the marquee de Sade reminds us of that don't That's forget there. yeah whereas rousseau says no that's only, not true at all only sees the good <laughs> yeah And I guess the other thing uh, she talks about the um, the hierarchy. Yes. So mm -hmm. we live in hierarchies. Sometimes they're just, sometimes they're not. Sadomasochism allows you to play with them, support them, make fun of them, uh, reverse them. And in that sense, it's an outlet for repression. So then, what would she say to um, anarchists? Who believe that the that the primary problem with society is high is the hierarchies, um, and that the the only way to you're delusional. <laughs> but we're all delusional. So right, there are hierarchies that can't change, um, and then there are hierarchies that can be replaced by other hierarchies. Um, matro uh, mat matriarch matriarchy is a fiction. It's not going to ever work. Uh, well, it it is in terms of at least the mother, yes. mother child. Yes, sorry. So I'm that not... hierarchy exists, and yes. so does the family hierarchy. Yes, but and beyond the, that, even the family hierarchy can change because we now have blended families. We have adopted kids and uh, all that kind of stuff. And if you've got polyandry and poly, uh, poly, the other one. What's the other one? Uh, uh, it can all change. 
so even the family is is a particular category that may not necessarily be realistic. Um, so so then what's her take on hierarchy in society? It's absolutely necessary. Which who's in power uh, will probably always be men. Uh, who's in jail will probably always be men. Uh, the caregivers will probably always be women. So this, I, I think I would argue with her on, on, on this, like you, I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that you wouldn't have, like, you could easily, you could make a society, socialism, for example, where, uh, the economic hierarchies are, do, no longer exist. Like there's no private property. There's no hoarding of wealth or oh, power. Yeah. You can yeah. distribute power fairly evenly. Whereas, and you could still, you could still keep hierarchies of competence like uh, uh, Jordan Peterson likes to talk about all the time. Every, everything to him is a hierarchy of competence. Um, yeah, that's you know, in, in not TP, historically accurate. <laughs> well, it's not historically accurate, but uh, but I mean, he really believe he believes in the meritocracy and hi in hierarchies. Um, Maybe he's an idealist. I think so. That's why he's so delu deluded. <laughs> um, but they're friends, uh, yeah, they Pagli, are. Pagli and, and Peterson. Um, but you know, just be, so just because I don't know, it sounds like she's justifying basically what we have now is the you know the 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 the, the multi billionaires up top and oh. everyone at the ninety percent at the bottom. So it yes, sounds like yes and no. So in the sense that somebody has to be on top and somebody has to be on the bottom, yes. In the sense that it has to be millionaires, no, I don't think she would say that, or I don't think she would say that that's in fact the case. Um, I mean, I think she considers herself a leftist or a liberal, doesn't she? Yeah, she she voted green last time. She's always voted Democrat before that. Right. So, okay, so yeah, in the sense that there has to be some sort of hierarchy, yeah, that's that's natural. Um, if it's if it's not the strongest, it could be the um, the smartest, and if it's not the smartest, it could be the richest, and if it's not the richest, it could be the democracy. The democracy. Um, there's a whole set of different hierarchies that could be done. Well, at the very least, there'll probably always be a sexual hierarchy. Yes, um, that at, one, the, at the very least, right? Like, yes, unless unless literally forced monogamy was was how you did it. But other than beyond that, there'd still um, be ways to rebel against it. Although you know, the church kind of tried and failed. I mean, it's been around for a couple of thousand years and more or less has distributed sexual partners. Although marriage for, for the longest time was really only for the upper class. So. Hmm. But yeah, but but there's there was still there was there will still all be always be, you know, certain men for whatever reason will get the majority of the of the partners yes men are designed in a sense to try and do that that's part of uh how we do uh, that started in infancy where we try and distinguish ourselves from the mother where we have to act in order to define ourselves as men right so in that sense those hierarchies likely will never be uh ab abolished no there'll always be a pecking order even among my okay, I'm looking at my kids. Uh, they love to diss each other, right? Like to my two brother, uh, their two their two brothers, uh, and they'll say something that'll annoy the other one. And he has an option: he can either fight back in the sense of diss him back, or not. If he doesn't. He lost his space in the pecking order, and that goes with uh, their friends in school as well. And if it gets really violent, um, that's. Uh, that's a major challenge but so there's hierarchies everywhere that we see them uh, it's not just boys it's girls too but i think boys are more uh, more obvious about it yes yeah absolutely well yeah there's pecking orders among you know the girl groups too yes uh in schools for sure but it's the boys that get into bigger trouble for that it's also the boys that get killed often because they're doing something to get higher on their pecking order than they. Than right, they're, they're taking more, they're taking more risks. They're doing more absurd things too. Yes, and those risks are what puts them further ahead or dead more often. Right, right. So okay, so then um, 
Yeah, that kind of flies in the face of the uh, one of the main uh, uh, men's rights activists uh, arguments is that you know it's men who are who are dying in uh, in wars. It's men who are dying in in the construction jobs and the coal mines, and it's men who uh, they die earlier in general. Um, I mean, that, even testosterone itself is more about a volatile uh, uh, hormone. Yes, and Pagda admits all that. She, yeah, basically, men have been doing that for women for thousands of years. Does she say something, anything about the expendability of men? Yeah, we're much more expendable than women are. That's why we say women and children first when there's a ship dying. All right, so the, so then the she the. The, the men's rights activists would uh, would uh, agree with her then there. Yes, so uh, she gives lots of examples on that. So um, one from her particular culture says that if a woman is violated in, in Italian culture, uh, the men would go and get that guy, either castrate him or kill him. Um, there's, a there's a whole chapter in the Bible where that happens. I think it's uh, Jacob's daughter or somebody's daughter gets raped, so her brothers go out and kill the entire city. I think it's, uh, I think it's chapter Genesis 20, 34, 24, something like that. Um, they trick them into uh, saying, okay, you can join us. You can, your tribe can join our tribe. Uh, you just got to get circumcised. And while all the men were, you know, in pain, they went and slaughtered them all. So then that's because their sister was violated. That's what the Bible says. So um, this has been going on for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, religion is misguided to relax these the rituals. Yes. Oh, that's okay. So when yeah, okay, that's a small point we might have missed. Um, for her, the power of religion is in the ritual. So if it because it it, it fulfills a certain need of, of people, you relax that, and people start saying, "I don't want to go. I don't think I don't see anything for me there." So if it's song or dance or singing rock and roll songs or um, lining up to grab some wafer or having the priest dress in like really cool dresses uh, or um, vestments, whatever it is, uh, the ritual is what attracts ones to sacred space. That is church space, essentially. The ritual is what attracts them? Yeah, and it's also the reason they keep coming back. I guess um, so, yeah. Take out the ritual and the religion is more likely to die. And this is part of the reason why Catholicism is probably the the oldest institution out there. It's they claim two thousand years old, and every evidence suggests that. You have Protestant denominations that break away from that, remove the ritual, and they tend to die out much sooner. Um, look at uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, all these ancient religions. They have a lot of ritual. Judaism. Uh, it seems that the more ritual you have, the more longevity you'll have. Well, if, if anything's on the rise now in terms of Christianity, it would be the uh or at least have staying power it's the, the the evangelical churches well they're wild... surprised but we're not sure if they have staying power they are a new phenomenon compared to 2000 years of catholic ritual right but the okay fair i mean but the you don't see uh you don't see lots of young people heading for the catholic churches you see a lots of young people like justin bieber and all these clowns heading to the 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 wacky evangelical churches yes so Maybe they're providing something else, but uh, all other things being the same, ritual is absolutely necessary to attract people, and that's part of the reason. And that's the popularity of sadomasochism. There's a lot of ritual in that. Is there? Okay. All right. And there you have it. So that's the end of Paglia. Is that the whole? Is that the whole book? That's it? Uh, no, it's not the whole book, but uh, I'm getting tired. Of, of Paglia? Yeah, I think we covered like. A, 22 of the sexual persona. There might be a couple more. I think we didn't do the Gorgon. Um, I'm not sure if I can pick another one. I might someday, but for now. For uh, now we're done. No more Palia. We're going to do, the next book we're going to do is uh, called The Hatred of Democracy by um, Jacques Rancure. He's a French guy. Uh, he's got a pretty unique take on it. And, um, the Hatred of Democracy? Yes. Okay. Interesting. A, there's a new modern hatred, but that'll have to be on that. Day. There, there is a new modern hatred of democracy. Yes, interesting. Okay, I was thinking about democracy today. And All right. it doesn't work. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> not in capitalism. Not, not in capitalism, anyway. 
Um, I mean, if Boris Johnson can get elected, Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, thanks, Jeff. I'll let you get, you got to you got to head out soon. So uh, that is Camille Paglia. Uh, if anybody watching or in the comments has uh, anything to say or wants to take on uh, uh, some of any of Paglia's arguments, just leave some comments. Uh, all right, that's it. Have a good one, Jeff. Thanks for uh, for being on. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.